Welcome everybody to episode number 26. And I'm going to give you a little preview of my upcoming course there at danjohnuniversity.com. The course is going to be called The Art of Coaching. And basically coaching is broken up into three parts. Uh, what you know, what you do, and the best phrase I've ever heard for part three is savoir faire. Um, that's that ability to change instantly if something comes up, uh, a, a national tragedy, uh, a local tragedy, uh, a slippery field, uh, forgetting your uh, uniform. Savoir faire is the ability to adapt to any circumstance. When you get to what we know, most people are pretty good about that. But it's how you apply it, that middle one, that's the most difficult. And in this first introductory lecture, I want to get to what I consider one of the biggest problems we have in the field of certainly strength and conditioning, but also in all coaching. And to be honest with you folks, it's, it's life. And this little quick topic is called don't be binary. And it comes up with those questions of like either or. And that's always an issue because it's a very low level of thinking. Now, there's nothing wrong with low levels of thinking, but life isn't always that simple. So this first introductory topic is called Don't Be Binary, Proactive Thinking for Coaching. Um, I, get, I get questions like this all the time. Um, is this a good diet? Well, I mean, if you've read a book like The Road and you're living on scraps, yeah, that's, that's good and that's all you have. Well, that's the best you're going to do. So that's a good diet. But to give me a good or bad or evil or good question about diets, very difficult. Is this a good food? That comes up all the time. This isn't moral theology. People ask me the question all the time, what's better? And then fill in these two things. Well, I hate to say the answer is it depends because there's more depth than that. Uh, this question comes up at workshops all the time. If you could do only do one exercise the rest of your life, and I just want to pull my hair out, what kind of world would we live in if we were required by what some guy in a black uniform with red stripes shows up and says, you can only do a fun exercise, you know? No, that just doesn't exist. And then, of course, this one, what is the single best thing to do with a kettlebell or a single best thing to do with a barbell? These are either or questions. These are binary questions. Um, <laughs> the one next one, will this make me a world champion? Will this make me fat? Will this make me ripped? Don't know. And, of course, my one of my favorite questions is, just give me a program and diet. I'll do whatever you say. And the truth is, folks, there are no perfect diets. There are no perfect programs. It's what you do and the time you spend. And of course, a personal one here. I had a girlfriend one time say to me, if you don't drive up to Vacaville tonight, you don't love me. At the time, I was too stupid to realize that driving two hours at 2 a.m. in the morning in a Pacific rainstorm on a motorcycle was a bad idea. When I got to Vacaville, I knocked on her sister's door and she, my girlfriend had been passed out drunk for five hours. That's a nice lesson. Oh, and uh, footnote, the relationship didn't last much after that. That's all either or thinking. That's all either or thinking. And that's not a good place to be in life. So I get kind of made fun of online that uh, I say it depends too much. In fact, I've pointed out before that there's someone in Australia who said he was going to punch me in the mouth next time I said, it depends. Well, when I went to Australia, he never showed up. And I said, it depends constantly while I was there. I was asked years ago about the book by Covert Bailey, Fit or Fat. And this is the first time I can clearly remember kind of pulling back and saying, well, that's not that's just not true. So this is the first quadrant I ever put together in my mind. Now, according to Covert Bailey, fit, of course, in fitness, in my definition, is the ability to do a task. But he had this concept of fit and not fat. And that would be his ideal world. 
But is that true? Is it possibly possible to be fit and fat? If you're an offensive lineman in the NFL and you're carrying around 50, 60 pounds of extra fat, now maybe it's not healthy and maybe it won't lead to longevity, but for the money you're being paid, that poor defensive lineman has to bench press through you for 60 minutes all that girth. If you're a sumo wrestler, you need some girth there too. A hand went up when I pointed this out one time. It was interesting about that hand is the person said, well, there's this Russian guy who's dominating sumo wrestling right now and he's lean. And I said to the person, you've just proved my point. That there is not a fit or fat. You've already given us options. And of course, <laughs> there are times you can be not fit and not fat. Uh, we call that skinny fat. That comes from Josh Hillis's uh, great blog where he shows us people who look very good in clothes, but very bad on the beach, so to speak. They look good in clothes, but they don't look uh, when they're exposed. And of course, there's one other uh, option here is to be fat and not fit. And the example I use here is I went on a vacation uh, not long ago to uh, Las Vegas. And uh, I always joke to people, if you're really feeling bad about yourself, go to Las Vegas and sit in a chair and watch humanity. I was going to say walk by, but waddle by is often just as true. Um, there are other options besides fit or fat. And this course then came up when I was first lecturing on tension, the importance of tension. In my quadrant four, which we'll get to at another time, um, that would be powerlifting and basically the 100 meters, and you could say Olympic lifting, there is a role of tension in these sports. If you're deadlifting, you want absolute tension, and that'll allow you to win. But if you run the 100 meters, you need to control that tension. You need to relax. So to win in the 100 meters, you want to relax. To win in the deadlift, you want tension. And when I started working on this idea, it began to flow into every aspect of what I do. Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, Dave Davis, of course, talked about the same thing in this particular article in Track and Track Technique in March and June 1974, when I was a high school junior, completely changed the way I trained myself. He went and talked to the greatest shot putters in the world at this time. And by the way, it's still a who's who in our field. And what he discovered was that it wasn't that shot putters either power lifted or Olympic lifted, but shot putters combine the power lifts and the Olympic lifts. All these decades later, that's still the best advice I've ever heard for how you train. It's not for a track athlete this or that. It's the skill set in incorporating these two different concepts. Now, this is nothing new. For those of you who have ever followed uh, this, this idea of the the Eisenhower box, you will notice that this, this is from when I was born. And it's a, it's a way to look at it. Now, if you read the, the work of Stephen Covey, he uses this box quite a bit. He separates tasks into two parts. Urgent, important. Is something urgent or not urgent? Is something important or not important? And you know what? Let's look right away to the one that most people miss. Something that's not urgent and it's not important. Once I started thinking about this at my old administrative job, I just decided to eliminate all those tasks. If it wasn't important and it wasn't urgent, why am I even doing it? Um, now, there are other tasks that are urgent and important. To me, urgent and important was a little bell that went off in my head. My goal was to take all those tasks that were urgent, right? It has to be done quickly and important. For example, I'll tell you a quick one. If your daughter throws up on you, you now have an urgent and important task to deal with your child 
and clear up the vomit. I tried the best I could to slide all these urgent tasks that were important over to important and not urgent. And I did that through checklists. So I was always ahead of the game. I was always working on those forms, that paperwork, well before it was due. So I never felt like anything was that urgent. And of course, the last one, if it's urgent and not important, let somebody else do it. Again, this is how Eisenhower boxed his tasks up. And what we should really spend our time with is getting ourselves, I think, over into this, this important and not urgent. Having said that, I ran from here into one of my favorite exercises of all time, what we call the goal setting exercise for people with lofty goals. Now, I took this from the work of Tony Robbins, but very simply, and this is something I want you to think about, is... Do means you get your goal. Don't means you don't get your goal. Pain is the pain you will get from either getting your goal. Wait, there's pain in getting your goals? Yes. Or the pain in not getting your goals. And then the other one is this. The pleasure of achieving your goal and the pleasure of not achieving your goal. This was a great game changer for me as a coach. Because by setting this quadrant up, one of the first things we found out with elite athletes was this. They never thought of two things usually. They really didn't think about how much pleasure they would get if they got their goal. One of my athletes once said, and he filled in that box with, it would be great. That was it. But boy, this athlete sure had a lot of stuff filled in on the box said the pain of not getting the goal. And that's when I realized with this particular athlete, I needed to focus on, well, obviously letting them know there's gonna be a lot of pleasure in getting their goals, but I used the lever of the pain to make this athlete work harder. Folks, this is quadrant thinking. This is not binary thinking. There is a place, as we'll go through in the lecture, there is a place for binary thinking when you're assessing. And basically, you're trying to get yourself into a little matrix. If yes, then. If yes, then. If yes, then. And at the end of that, do this. If yes, then. And you get to the box. Now we do this. But binary thinking by itself is a very, very low level of thinking. This is just a preview of this lecture. There's a lot more to go on this lecture and there's a lot more boxes for you and I to fill in. This is gonna be part of the Dan John University and we're gonna have a total of 10 different modules. This is one of, uh, one of the first modules. So not only is a lot more in this lecture, but there's a whole bunch more to this whole course. Well, it's time for questions. This is always exciting for me. Our first question comes from Eric. I am a 47-year-old man that started strength training six months ago. I've been learning things about what to do from various online sources. Well, Eric, you got to be very careful about online sources, but you know what, am I, what can I say? I'm online. And I'm realizing I'm not really the target audience of, what, of, of much of what I read, as I don't have access to barbells or kettlebells, am very inexperienced, and have never been strong. What books, yours or otherwise, would you recommend that I read first to get a good foundation? Well, I, since you asked for my work, I would say the book, Now What? Uh, no, check that, Intervention, I'm sorry. I would say Intervention would be your best choice. This is the book where I actually talk to people like you, <laughs> people like you, <laughs> and I try to do my best to get them in a structure. But I have something better for you at the end of this. I'll, I'll give it to you. Obviously, I could use your workout generator, but I'd rather understand basic principles so that I can plan my own workouts and help my teenage children also. Eric, that's great about the kids too. Well, okay, so here's there's two parts. Okay, part one, there's your book. Now, the workout generator is based on this book, all right? But what I would strongly recommend is 
you go to the workout generator, you type in what equipment you have, and if there's none, that's fine too. Uh, I certainly think that with maybe 30 or 40 or maybe even $50, you could probably pick up uh, the ab wheel, a, a foam roller, a, a piece or two of other piece of equipment, and you might be able to get going. It won't be very expensive to get started. But plug in what you know, and then when you get into the workout generator itself, go to each and every exercise exercise and ratchet them up and down and watch the short video that we've offered you to look at how the technique should be. And you're gonna get a lot of information by just using the workout generator and the up and down button. And yeah, it can be as simple as push-ups and air squats and single leg standing, um, uh, well, naked, uh, the single leg standing uh, deadlift, that's maybe all you need. It doesn't have to be that much. Uh, don't underestimate things like walking and the basics. You can get a lot of good, Eric, from a simple body weight or limited equipment workout. That's a good question. Answer, intervention, and go to Dan John University and use that park bench generator. Chris asks a good question. Um, he calls them farmer swings or two-handed kettlebell swings. He saw a clip, he'd never seen them before. Well, if I understand it, it's also known as outside swings. And outside swings became popular, oh, it has to be about a decade ago now, when uh, a very famous uh, powerlifter, and I, the name escapes me, was, was a little bit too huge to do standard kettlebell swings. And so he started doing the kettlebell swing with the bells going on the outside of the knees. Boy, I tell you, it's a great variation unless something goes wrong and something seems to go wrong sometimes. Um, since you don't, it's going to be like what you do in a standing long jump. But you have to be very careful that you're setting the bells straight back and not up at all. Um, is it a good exercise or a bad exercise? It all depends on your technique and how it, how it feels for you. One small thing I was told, now I don't have, I'm, I'm no back expert, but the issue with having those bells out here is it uh, on your lower back, it puts a tremendous stress on that lower back because of where, where the ballistic and the load is. So it, it, if you have a dicey lower back, this might not be a way to go. But if you're a very large power lifter and you need a, you want to do some ballistic swings uh, and this works for you, it's a great exercise. Uh, so there are going to be some caveats in my answer. Um, your, your mileage may vary, okay? We have a question from Elizabeth and Elizabeth asks a theology question of a kind. I am considering doing the 10,000 swing challenge as an extra treat for Lent. I've never heard 10,000 swing challenge and treat in the same sentence. I wondered whether you ever set yourself an extra challenge for Lent and you think that is a good idea or not. So Elizabeth, um, here's something simple. I don't drink soft drinks. It's not because I'm some wonderful dietary person. It's because when I was in the eighth grade, I felt like I was drinking soft drinks too much. So in the eighth grade, I gave up soft drinks for Lent. And outside of an occasional mixed drink, I don't think I've had a soft drink. I don't think I've had a can or a bottle of a soft drink, I, I would say, for decades. Now, if I get the flu, my wife makes me drink, uh, I don't want to name the companies, but they're the, the fizzy lemon-lime drinks, okay? Because uh, magically, that's supposed to be good for your stomach. So yes... I will drink them when I'm vomiting. Um, yeah, I think doing extra challenges for Lent is really a good idea. Um, the I, the word Lent mean it comes from the same root as lengthening. It's the time of year where the, the days are lengthening. Um, we begin with Carnival, which means the Feast of Meat. And the idea was you eat all the stored meat that you had, and then you let nature do its thing for the next couple of months. And your job during that time uh, is to uh, kind of clean up your act a little bit. It's interesting because the month February comes from the same basic 
concept. This is the month of purification. That's what February means. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of your idea here, Elizabeth. Uh, I've always thought it is easier to do something when you are involved in a community of some kind. Uh, and I, uh, I guess the atheists or the agnostics in our group are probably rolling their eyes. Um, but uh, I think if you're doing something and you say, okay, God, help me, I think it helps just a little bit too. So Elizabeth, I love where your head's at and good luck. And I want to know how you do on it. And remember, maybe God is watching, but definitely I'm watching. Okay, I have a question from Paul. And Paul, you're very lucky because my dog, Sirius Black, just laid down next to me. So I'll be petting his head while I answer your question. I have a question about some alternatives to some of the traditional barmel movements. Yeah, I remember reading this question, and uh, this will be an interesting one. I am in my early 50s and have just started to lift weights. I use a landmine press instead of military press, landmine gobble squat instead of back front squat, and a trap bar instead of a barbell deadlift. I would appreciate your views on these alternatives. Well, it, it's it's tough for me to answer that, Paul, because you know you're 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 new to lifting and and you're using those pieces of equipment. Are you using them because you have them, or are you using them because they're easier on your joints? I don't know. Uh, I am certainly not a fan of spending that kind of money when you could have done all that for a simple three ten barbell set that you can bet buy over here very inexpensively at uh, played against sports. Um, I, I, I've always said the trap bar deadlift is fine done correctly, but I rarely see it done correctly. Uh, I see people's knees come in, they leg press it, they drop their shoulders out. If you have good technique, I'm fine with it. I, I'd, I would have liked to know why you went to these first. I would also, I also have another question about best methods of pro progressive overload for the older lifter. Would you ask? Would you recommend adding weight, reps, volume, or some other progression? Well, of course. I'd recommend you add appropriately reps, appropriately sets, appropriately load, and appropriate, and this is going to be tough because of the options you picked, exercise selection. That's something most people miss when you talk about progression. I have something called the Movement Matrix. Uh, you can see it in the article uh, in Dan John University called Snapacity. Um, if you read my last book, 40 Years with a Whistle, I have it in there. Uh, I'm a big believer that your exercise choices should be progressive also. So yeah, load's the easy one. You start off at 10 pounds, you go to 15, you go to 20, 25, 30. That's the easy one. Reps, you start out with five reps, you slide up to eight reps, you slide up to 12 reps. That's now too light. You go back to five reps. Uh, you start off with three sets of five, after a while, that doesn't seem to uh, make your body accommodate. So now you move up to five sets of five. But I also think you need to have progressive exercise variation. So, um, you know, if you, you know, in a simple one I do with shot putters, we, we bench press, then we incline press, then we decline press, then we military press. When we come back to the bench press, miraculously, we're stronger. Uh, and it just keeps going on. Um, in the hinge family, you might start off with the hip thrust. Uh, the Well, actually, the glute bridge. You move to the hip thrust. You might move to the kettlebell swing. You might move to the Olympic snatch. That is progression. So yeah, Paul, I'm a big believer in progression. But don't forget exercise selection. Ah, we have a question from Daniel. Daniel, that's a lovely name. Oh, and, and folks, when you're, uh, just as a small note, please don't say John, comma, when you uh, are referring to me. My first name is Dan or Daniel or Danny. And so when you're, in, when you're following up on the questions down there, use my first name, not my last name. Do you have strength standards for kettlebells? Yes, I do. Google Dan, John, and go to, and then also, Sleepless in Seattle. In, at that site, I give you every kettlebell standard I can think of, okay? How about standards beyond the gym? Things like running, jumping, throwing, etc. Well, if you're serious, yeah. 
Uh, I would suggest you, you type in maybe uh, USA Track and Field. Um, if you go to the master's site, they will give you the list of uh, what it takes to be an All-American. And that'll do it for you. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, I have standards, obviously, in the discus and shot, but I don't have them in all of them. I also have a parenting question. Uh, I have a 12-year-old son who I have great relationship, but I feel like I'm failing in instilling healthy habits. He has watched his father exercise, train martial arts, eat vegetables at every meal. Good job, Daniel. And go to sleep early his whole life. But it seems like he's rebelliously wants to do the opposite. And then you have the two perfect words right now. Do I just keep giving a, a good example and hope it is just a rebellious face? Well, I know this. If I ever had to go back to teaching and they offered me a... Mm, if they offered me $10,000 a year to coach, you know, discus, you know, the throws, I would do that in high school or college. If they offered me $10 million to teach junior high where your son is right now, I would still say no. If they went to $100 million, uh, my wife would put a gun to my head and I would say yes. But uh, I... 12-year-old boys, I got to tell you, 12, 13, you know, you are earning, you are earning heaven right now, Daniel. Yeah, you just keep it doing it. You just keep on it. And he is in a rebellious phase. Uh, hopefully you can, you can find somebody, a good role model, a mentor for him, a good coach. He, the good coach will say the exact same things you're saying. And he'll come home and say, jeepers, dad, I should eat vegetables at every meal. And you'll go, oh, Shut up. Don't say a word. Say, oh, that's a really good idea. And just put your head back down. And trust me, one day your kids get into their late 20s and they become humans again. Uh, you've got a ways to go. Last but not least, could you give me your thoughts on what you know of the status of physical education in the United States? I would also, okay, um, it's struggling. I mean, it's we have lost our way. Uh, I think it goes back to Bush and his uh, no child left behind policy, which if you ever teach, you'll find out that that's almost impossible. Fam there are families and people who choose to not be part of this direction we're going educationally. And so we pretty much gouged uh, physical education, music, arts, auto repair, electrical stuff, all the stuff that really some kids when they go to high school and if they take a class on electrical repair they find the job of their lives and they're happy not everyone's going to fall in love with beowulf like i did and a lot of kids are going to take a pe class and find a career that changes their lives so i i put directly the blame on that uh the fact that all we do my poor daughter kelly tells me Everything's a test. All they do now is study for tests. I would also like your opinion on how to develop physical literacy in children. Yeah, um, take, their, uh, take their telephones and take their computers, uh, hit them with a sledgehammer, find a, <laughs> find a playground and send them out there for four hours. <laughs> or <laughs> have a mom like I had who said, go outside and play. Um, I'm not sure she ever said anything else to me. Specifically, do you have any ideas on how we can go about within the constraints of an elementary school PE teacher? In California, I see my kids once or twice, uh, one or two times a week for 30 minutes. Well, Daniel, all I can tell you, and God bless you for what you do, is, you know, when you go to a place like Ireland, um, which has a, a magnificent physical education program, it's funny because when I talk to the Irish, they don't think it's very good. They focus so much on little things like proper jumping technique, uh, proper sprinting technique, uh, proper ways to um, do things like, uh, um, I was doing the speed skater there, but uh, stumble proof, when you put your load here and you put your load there. They, they, do, they do so much with pedagogy on how you move. If all you got is once or twice a week, man, I tell you, if all you did was work on good sprint and jump technique with your kids, it would be a game changer. You know, get them to stop running like this and their arms up here. That might be all you need to do. And good luck to you. And I'm hoping I'm hoping the best for you. 
Well, thank you for listening. Remember, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com.